tell the story, get people to join in, bring them on a journey, More get story. people to join yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. resolve it, people die. Sure. <laughs> cool vibration. Cool vibration. Well, it's the old pagan thing with the school, isn't it? That's, there you that's go. the cover. There you go. Cucumbers, they get knackered pretty quick though. That's true, actually. You're cutting this. <laughs> this isn't rock and roll, folks. <laughs> Space. Space. And cucumbers. cucumbers. Space and cucumbers, that's your advice, right? No. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Charlie Talk. This is a show where I, the lead singer of indie rock band Charliewood, talk to musicians about making music. This is a show about supporting local music, so please take a minute to like and subscribe to the channel if you want to do that. That would really help us grow and support other artists, which is one of the main things that this is about. And today I'm joined by singer-songwriter Shane O'Farreel. Hello. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Thanks for coming in. Very, very happy to be here. <sighs> so, um, I got a new thing on uh, on the Charlie Talks. What I'm going to do now and forever is play a little 40 second snippet of a song that you've chosen. It is the song Gale, which is a live recording. Yes. Yep. Right. So people can just check out where you're at. And I might put on some fun facts in the old top of the pop style at the bottom. Great. of this 40 second clip. So let's watch that now. Thread your track The long way back Across oceans that crack With your mystery And tell me What you learned From all the bridges That burned that stun you to done mourns in a melody And we're all so sick and tired of it Sick to the back teeth of this shit Can you stand up and be counted? Can you stand up and be counted? Yes, we're all so sick Nice. Cool. You may have, <coughs> I have a frog floating right there, so I'm... A, f a frog? A frog. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll stop it. I'm going to stop it. it. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so, yeah, I normally ask the artist when they come in to begin by just giving us a bit of background, a bit of biog and a bit of an introduction. So, okay. Please. My name is Shane O'Farrell. I come from Dublin. Um, it's a small island over that direction somewhere. Um, I've been living in Vienna for... Just over three years now. Well, the guitars came over three years ago. I've All been, accounts. Yeah. And um, I've been writing songs for probably nigh on 20 years now. It wasn't my original idea. It just happened that way. Okay, interesting question. What was the original idea? Um, I was an animator, storyboard artist, graphic artist. Oh, that was shit. what I studied in, in, uh, in Dublin. All right. Yeah, and um, worked for a lot of the big the big houses, moved around the world and huh. wrote songs in the evenings. All oh, right. So it worked out. Okay, yeah. well, since we're at that point, what was it? What, was there a single event, uh, a life-changing light bulb moment where you went, ah, oh, this is a thing that I could do? Um, no, I think it was gradual. Um, we used to be playing at trad sessions around, you know, in the evenings around Irish bars and got into some trad sessions and would all, all of a sudden pop, throw a song into the mix and people would say like, God, where did you get that? Where, where's that from? I hadn't heard that before. And I went, that's my own song. Yeah, and they were like, what of mine. So yeah, <laughs> one of oh, many. Well, that little thing. But it was because of people's reaction, I think, and friends going, right. play such and such a song. I'd never, never planned. I was a nervous wreck going on stage originally. And yeah. um, I never saw it coming. I always loved music. But in Ireland, music is always kind of external. It's never something that you would make a living from, which sounds weird. Yeah. But you, I mean, the stereotype is trad music sessions down the pub. Like, yeah, yeah. How how yeah. how real is that? Like, how much of that is actually going on? In it's, very, it's it's very real. I'm, 
I think things have changed with the Celtic Tiger. Tiger things changed drastically, but I think we're veering back to that. Gaelic and Celtic culture is very much about the family and about circles and people singing and getting together of, the, of an evening, which would have happened in England, Scotland. Everyone was doing it. Everywhere, and it's how we keep together as Irish sure. people and um, our, our Celts. It's it's a it's a poetic thing. So yeah, it's pretty pretty genuine, and um, the pub was just an extension of that. Right. So why did it never stop in Ireland? And because people are still doing like folk music sessions in pubs in Britain, but mm. it's no longer a stereotype. You don't. You can occasionally go into a pub where people are all singing together and having a traditional sing-song type session. But you have any thoughts on that? Like- I, I would like to think it's because of again, it's embedded in the culture. It's always been there. You know. Um, you know that that. Gaelic tradition of meeting in people's houses around, especially in winter, where people get together and um, just carrying on and, and singing, you know, dark nights. Yeah. And I think um, it's, it's dare I say it, it's kind of saved us in it to a degree with all of the historical um, events that have happened in Ireland and to the Irish over the years. We, we've, we've had that to cling on to, you know. Yeah. We've had our music, we've had our art, we've had... Or comedy, you know, that that I suppose it's the one thing we could fall back on when times got got tough. Okay, so while we're on the biography, um, do you have an earliest memory of music or, or a, a, an early memory of music that made a strong impact? I do, my granny's house. Yeah, again, Saturday nights, all the family were over singing, you know, everyone getting together. A few yeah. drinks, songs were just ripping the ceiling off the room. That was a thing. Yeah. And that is a, like a traditional, like that's a very common thing that really yeah. is. Now again, it's it, when you say traditional, I think there was there was elements of obviously a lot of pop, like the Beatles would have been there. You would have Stones, you would have Von, Van Morrison. So it wasn't just maybe Herman 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 Herman's Hermans. Oh, you know all these songs that were in the charts at the time, sure. like or even into the seventies when I was growing up as a kid, you you would have heard, heard them songs. But then you would have the Irish songs, the Rebel songs, or the ballads, or. Then you'd flip back to the Beatles and, you know, so it was very contemporary and yet traditional. Cool. Great crack. Yeah. yeah I really crack. like the idea of it. Yeah. You have to you have to know where to look in England if you want to do something right. like that. But, yeah, it's uh, I've got a very romanticised idea of, of how that must be. So let's get to your music now. Uh, I, of course, have been playing the album on loop to get ready to talk to you. Uh Really nice uh, stuff. I would say that you, um, it's very uh, classical balanced melody, sort of melody driven stuff. I am reminded, uh, I mean, you were there before, but I am reminded of a lot of the times Ed Sheeran in his more romantic efforts. Okay. Um, from the From the melody and also a lot of, from the instrumentation that you're choosing. For the okay. album. I oh, wish you plug the album as well. It's called There Might Be Dolphins 2016, right? Yep, yeah, almost. That, they, they might see dolphins. They might see dolphins. Link in the description. It's on the Spotify's and all the places. Where should people listen to it? Where would you like them to listen to it? Live. Come to a concert. Come to a gig, yeah. Come to a gig. Have a listen there. It has a live feel, and I, I would hope you would agree with that. I think yes. it's um, it, it was meant to sound like it should sound, you know, with, with as little production as possible. There is production there, but... And, you know, being in a band yourself, mm. um, live is smoke and mirrors, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So it's just a replication of... I think the songs do stand up live. They really, they really um, explode live, whether it be solo or with a band. It's bloody difficult to reproduce the energy of a live situation in the studio. Yeah. Did you take any steps to try and do that? Like, uh, for example, we recorded our both of our albums in the room together. We put all the amps in separate rooms and had them mic'd up in closed-off rooms, but we stood in a room together to, yeah. to play. Did you yeah. do anything to try and get There was live? bits and pieces. I think we tried to mirror that, but, like, for example, the drums were put down in one track. You know, I was in the room with the drummer, maybe with an acoustic guitar, yeah. and we were playing along or or um, live vocal takes with guitar and things like that. So that energy at least was captured. Cool. Yeah. 
it's difficult, as you, as you say. Wow, and it's really difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. People, people often comment, like, after they come to our concerts for the first time, they were like, oh, you guys are way better live. Holy crap. And what a compliment. It's, it's a very nice compliment, and okay. I'm pleased, but it's frustrating because, of course, the vast majority of the people are listening to us uh, through our records, but they're like a business card, and it's mm. very, very difficult. Because you can't feel the music either, like the sound's not hitting your whole body unless you've got a crazy... Well, that's true. I think crazy one of the first bands I, I ever saw live were, were The Mission, the English band from the okay. north of England. Link in the description. Great band. Yeah. And um, all I can remember is the bass drum on my chest of these big, big rigs. Yeah. You know, I'd never felt that before and that was just, what's going on? Yeah. Straight up to the stage. I couldn't hear anyone for a week. Head in the speakers, you know? For real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wear my, uh, I got some rehearsal earplugs, which drop everything by 10 dB, Great. but it's like a flat frequency curve, uh, and I exploit them in every live concert I go to so I can get right up near the front. Right, and without would, do you use them down. when you're singing as well? Yeah. How does that affect the voice? Uh, you need to get used to it. But because you pick up a lot more skull vibration, mm. um, you perceive it more, it, it is possible to intonate properly, like right. once you get used to it. Right. But at the beginning, I was taking them out because I'd, I'd start with it and I was like, ah, oh, no, I don't. But if you just always have them in, get used to it, yeah. you get used to it. And... School vibration, it's going to be big. Mm -hmm. School vibration? Skull vibration. School vibration. <gasps> that's, a name, that's a name of a band. Or Skull a song. Vib Skull vibration. Or an album. Skull. Who knows? Yeah, it's a good album name as well. School vibration. Skull vibration. Well, it's the old pagan thing with the school isn't it that's there you that's go. the cover there you are it <laughs> <out. laughs> i'm going to put a skull in your hand look into the camera and hold up a skull and look spooky and i'll put a skull in it's your hand in post the skull of a madder yeah just. could you make a stab at describing a typical or interesting songwriting process or technique that you use um at the moment i think um all I can tell you is I, I try to encompass all of it. It's never just about the the word or the melody or the or the chord sequence or the progression. I think um, the length of time I've been writing songs, you 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 have to be ready for when that song comes and give it all that it needs. And what I do now is I use all the information that I have to know if it's going to be coming through a guitar, it's coming through a piano, it's coming through the ether or if it's just coming from my desire to to stand up and say something that really pisses me off mm -hmm. I'm getting much better at that mm -hmm. so I think the trick is the process for me is is the process if that's not too vague yeah try and get a feel for what the song needs mm -hmm. and take yeah. it as it comes yeah be ready for it I mean there's so many different ways to write a song people you know it's it's the it's the million dollar question sure that's why I ask it everybody who how do you write a song yeah. or what comes first the song sure. comes first, I think. I mean, sure. It's been knowing which way the song is going to come at you. Yeah. Or else if knowing if you're going to come at the song. Because I think when you when you do develop your craft, you can sit down and, and manufacture. Of course. Scratch. How often do you do that? Let's do like a rough percentage. How much is a song coming at you and how much are you going after a song? When you at the moment now, it's probably 70, 30 I'm going at songs. Really? Because I've just... There's a lot going on that I want to talk about and I want to right. address. Right. I think I'm probably still, yeah, they're coming at me in a sort of 70-30 ratio, I'd say. They, mm. They're they coming at me and I just uh, get in like whole bits, walking Great. or cycling. Great. Rhythmical movement, repetitive rhythmical movement, mm. being bored helps a lot. Yeah. Uh, I get most of it just like that. And then sometimes, as you say, I get annoyed. <laughs> Yeah. Or in other ways, emotionally happy. stimulated. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, happy's good too. In love is good. Sure. In like, in lust, in yeah, loss. It's all good. Yeah. But um, I think that the, again, it's it's the song. You know, whatever whatever the song is telling you, you pick it up. I love it though. It's to me, it's it's an obsession now. You yeah. know, the word is an obsession. Yeah. All right. I touched on it cheering earlier. I think you kind of liked it. Let's get back to Ed Sheeran for a second. What are your thoughts on him and his music? I compared you to him. What age is he? 27. What is he? Yeah, mid to late 20s, I guess. 
I mean, hats off, isn't it? Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, he deserves it. Absolutely. You know the story, right? Yeah. Oh, I do indeed. Like I do indeed. Thousands yeah. of shows. Yeah. Guy's great. Um, and he's a, he's a fellow songwriter. We're not in the business of knocking, knocking, no. knocking our fellow. Building stuff up, not tearing it down. Absolutely. Um, no, I've, I've, I think, um, I mean, look look at his influence. He's, he draws from everything. He's a very shrewd young man. Mm-hmm. And he's a very good writer. And like like all these these chaps that come up, I really want to see him rock his own boat. You know, mm-hmm. do something really different and explore the ability that he has or that he's developing. Sure. Because he's safe at the moment. Yeah. And that's the way I would see it. It's kind of, it harks back to the Coldplay's and, you know, when, when they came out for us, like, brilliant, this could be the future of things to come. And yeah, then... Yeah, yeah. What happens? What know, is it? Is it? Is it the... The books, <sighs> the, dome, the numbers, the numbers. Does, do they numbers. get obsessed with their numbers? Do you think? Because you do. Uh, you're absolutely right. We're we're broadening the the conversation now. Like you see bands that you get excited about, and they they seem to be taking things in a new direction. And then everyone gets excited, and they start doing the big numbers and the big money and the big heart chart positions. Yeah. And then something just sort of stops or starts. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe, I, see, I don't know because I've never stood in front of a crowd of 100,000 people. So I don't know what that would do to you. It does to your brain. You know, so I'm sure it does something. But obviously, they follow their path and that's the way it goes. I mean, yeah, I was, I mean, any album after Parachutes was disappointing for me. Mm-hmm. Those four, four songs I thought were yeah. cracking. But I mean, that would be the same with Ed Sheeran and anybody that comes up and does something different. I mean, if you look at the Nirvanas and, um, I mean, the Pixies were the ones that really kept it solid, didn't they? They didn't. Mm-hmm. They didn't compromise. Although they never made any money back in the day, but so I wondered had that anything to do with it? Nirvana weren't around long enough, so yeah. You know, Although they made Jeff significant Bobby. amounts of money while they were together, I think. Did they? Or did they? Did they? I wonder. Who Maybe made that money? Dave Grohl's still waiting to make some money out. Of his but look what Dave Grohl is doing. <laughs> I mean, he's man. he's married both, isn't he? He's gone kind of down the. Commercial yes. group, but managed to retain some sort of something punk ethos. Yeah. yeah. Yes, the the ethos. Yeah. Yeah. So Ed. Well shake it up. If either of us ever get hundred thousand people stadium famous, uh, we can let each other know. <laughs> I will I'll what give the you pitfalls the support. are. You've got to I'll come back. Big... You gotta promise now that you'll come I'll back. Do it. If you get hundred thousand people stadium famous, you've if, got to come back and let us know. If that happens, what it's I'm, like. I'm retiring to the west of Ireland and I'm gonna grow Plants. Right. And then you've got... I won't say which plants. Okay. Maybe zucchinis. Who knows? I mean, you get a lot of uh, bang for your buck out of a zucchini plant. Absolutely. They're very hungry. You've got to feed them. Have you seen that? Cucumbers. They get knackered pretty quick, though. That's true, actually. You're cutting this. (laughs) This isn't rock and roll, folks. (laughs) (laughs) I'm cutting all the plants for. Okay. So, jump cut. Ah, have you got any current musical uh, things that you want to tell the world about? Upcoming soon concerts that you want to let people know? Playing uh, Cafe Siebenstern in Vienna on the 29th of July. Right. Um, we're headlining the Bremen Folk Festival at the end of August. And I'm working on putting out an acoustic, more traditional Irish album. I've been threatening it for for the last three albums and all of a sudden they turn into the you know you kind of run with an idea producer and all of a sudden you're into unknown territory but this is an album that's been the songs are there and mm-hmm. um, it's a, it's been a labour of love and just keep it simple you know cool. but I have a band album lined up as well the songs are also written and um, with, with Shane O'Farrell and the host that's the live project we're going out as now and right great players all Austrian and that's the trend Bang. It's kind of trad. It's a bit of punk. It's it's quite. There's a bit of jazz. It's cool. alternative. I think okay. it's 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 rooty. I would like to think it's rooty, kind of Appalachian gotcha. Gaelic. Mm-hmm. We're trying to keep a toe line, you know, where we don't veer off the genre too much. But being a musician and a songwriter, you kind of go where the songs go, and it's difficult. So, yeah. and you know, labels, bookers, they all want a genre or a style. Which Pigeonholes. Is, How much do you worry about that? I never did in the past, but I think when you're when you're getting into sales and um, the numbers, <laughs> the numbers, yeah, it, it's something that has to be considered. You know, artistically, y- you should be able to do what you do, but I think um, there has to be a, a, 
the balance with the with the market and the industry, doesn't there? If you want to make a living from it, yeah, at least, it, yeah. like, yeah, I think that's the that's the thing. At the beginning, you've got that freedom, like probably most people who are going to do it for long enough to make a living from it, they don't start because they want to make millions. Like I'm guessing most people. Well, I think when they have, begin, we have a least. dream, don't we? We we have a dream where we go. We want to be rock and rollers. We want to be punk stars, or and it's never the money. It's always about the no the buzz, or you know, which are mates in a band. Yeah, friends. and I think I think the people who make it, they're not the ones who are doing it for the money because it requires such enormous perseverance and a huge amount of investment and time. The entire time during which you're making very little to no money to minus money, depending on, you know, how hard you're going at it. And if you were doing it for the money, like you give up. Like, I'm sure there are bands who start for the money and then mm. a lot of them realise they're not making any and then stop. Yeah, so. but there's a lot of bands out there are very shrewd. And once the money has always been there, they seem to do well. You know, they'll never be top chart sellers. Maybe they're cover bands or wedding bands, but... You know, hats off to them as well that can make that happen. It's harder for us um, towing the original line. Yeah. And, you know, that's I think that's where the real um, knife's edge is, where your your balancing act has to be almost perfect and pristine. Yeah. But that's a good pro tip. If you are a young person starting out playing music, uh, if you want to be able to make a reasonable living or good side money, weekend money, uh, a bloody good suggestion that you should consider is doing weddings and cover gigs and like you know, like beer festivals and things like that. They pay well. You have to play for like four, four to six hours normally. Mm. Um, so you have to have a bit of stamina. But if you just want to play on a stage and just yep. play, that is something definitely to consider, right? Like you can, and, and you can, co- you know, you can compromise, or you can also find your niche that the compromise isn't so, so great. Yeah, you know, f- streamline your act. If it's funk you love, do funk. Introduce your own songs. If it's folk, do folk. Introduce your own right. songs. You know, find a happy ground where the band are happy, you're happy. And of course, your punters and your slipping in some new, which yeah. is what you did basically I, I do, right? in that, the pubs. Back yeah, in the when day. I always went out and and I I told when I came to Vienna, this was the first city where I played bars because I was right. moving to Vienna, and I needed to ground myself and and obviously make some money. Um, I told all the venues that I was playing original music. I'll do a few covers, covers that I liked, and obviously, you know, if people like my music, they like the covers because. They're in the same vein, and it worked out. And I didn't. I've ha- I haven't had to compromise too much. Now, yeah, people will ask me for Ed Sheeran, and sure I've learned one song. All right. Um. But yeah, as a rule, like, oh, look, I'm an original musician, and um, mostly um, what I can do is segue songs, original songs, into covers and back out again to show some sort of common thread and okay. make it a little bit cheeky. But yeah, as a rule, like, I keep it original. But you do do requests. Yeah, if they're like the Pixies. Right. Or there you Nirvana, go. maybe. So people can make you happy if they come to your live gigs and say, yeah. play a Nirvana song! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I was once asked for um, American Pie. All right. In Germany a couple of years ago. And I never learned it and all the cover guys were doing it up there and I just look, don't do covers. And I was never asked again, strangely enough. Huh. Good song. Yeah, very, very long. Bloody long. What is very it? Long. Six verses, seven verses. Yeah. I'll put how many verses it is at the bottom of the screen now because I can't. Good remember. song, Don McLean. Rocking. Uh, yeah. So while we're on live performance, um, are you sometimes or often surprised by the live response that songs get? Like, because. I sometimes think I've got a single on my hands and I sometimes think I've got an album track on my hands and then I'll perform them live and I realise, okay, the the public response is very different to what I assumed. Mm. Does that happen to you? Yeah, I mean, I learned early that the public know best. Right. And um, I was surprised about the response to my songs. That was the reason why I followed through on it. Um, You know, coming from Irish tradition... There's always strong choruses. There's Kamali's, you know, crowd risers and rousers. 
And, um, because you're singing together, like there's yeah, a tradition that's, of that, that's right? that's the whole point of sure. getting people to come together. And, yeah. and that, that comes back to the session to the house. I mean, Noel Galler, who was reared in an Irish family in Manchester, speaks about the same thing. He says, that's probably why Oasis choruses are always so big, because they're always that kind of, you know, he grew up listening to Irish sessions in Manchester. <sighs> The pub vibe. Yeah. And we can hear that on your album as well. Like, yeah, there's a yeah, lot it's of there. I mean... Sing-along moments. You know, for... for If you're getting into the, the the kind of where the songs came from, I mean, I, I grew up listening to, to ballads and then I went my own road, punk, and, you know, trying to break out. Hip-hop was a big thing for me. Hip-hop was only new. Um, and this is the old hip-hop, like Jazzy Jeff, you know, the Master Flash and all this. When all it right. just came out of New York, we were wow. babies. And... Um, went from adamant to the police to hip-hop you know this type yeah. of thing yeah sure and then i got into kind of folk and goth but it, it, it's almost like the salmon i say this a lot when i'm talking about songs you start off in the wellspring in the pool of tradition sure. Sure. you swim out into the sea yeah and you find yourself over time coming back up the river to come back to your your roots sure, sure and sure. i think that's what i've done and I've i've learned all of these things along the way now Again, there's a lot of traditional there. And on the album, you can hear like Chalk is a very punk tune towards mm-hmm. the end. Mm-hmm. You've got a bit of folk. You've got even a little bit of contemporary, maybe Ed Sheeran there. I mean, I'm, I'm not listening to Ed Sheeran, but we can see where there's a... Does you can't get away from the man. No, the thing is, <laughs> the, the thing is, I think as well, his tradition, and he's an Irish tradition as well. And, yeah. you know, he draws from that. So, he sure has. Um, and I think a lot of people do. I think, you know, the verse chorus thing is... Is very much a folk thing, you know. For sure, yeah. You know, tell the story, get people to join in, bring them on a journey. More story, to join yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Resolve it, people die. Sure. <laughs> so, that, that's going in the intro. <laughs> that's, that's a sorry, brilliant. Mid- that's mid-morning. a brilliant summary of uh, traditional Irish folk song. <laughs> well, it's the traditional Irish um, lays and stories. You have the the oceanic lays or the old romance tales. Uh-huh. Everyone dies. Sure. But that's life in Disney. You don't. Do Come it. on, give us a give us a tune. I can put a link in the description for people to listen to. Uh, uh, for you, uh, like a classic example, just give us a track that people can find. Um, a classic example would be, I suppose, um, Spansel Hill. Spansel. Spansel Hill. Have a listen to that. Okay. Spansel Hill. It, it talks of a journey. Now, at the end of the song, he finds himself in a position, whether he's gonna. He's not in Ireland anyway, but it, it's not to give the song away, but it's a very good reflection of how a traditional ballad would flow cool. and an Irish story. And, you know, look at Brothers Grimm, the German, the old Deutsch stories. Mm-hmm. They're not, you know, they're all pretty hard and bleak. bleak. People enjoy hearing about messed up shit happening to yeah, other well, people. it's life, right? isn't it? Well, another great one would be Molly Malone. It's a typical oh, of course. song. Oh, yeah. You know, tells a story, sadly, our heroine. Mm-hmm. leaves us at the end brilliant links in the description what is your lyrical approach okay can you define that a little bit for me? yes do you prefer to create a mood and leave the listener to uh to their own experience of the music so leaving the lyrics far more abstract and vague or do you like to hit nails with hammers and make it explicitly clear i mean uh, we come back to of course the traditional irish storytelling verses for telling the story choruses for singing along together like where do you fall on that landscape lyrically very good question thank you i do my best um yeah it's again it's whatever the song needs right if I mean, if you go to tr- if you go the storytelling route, you have to develop a story, a start, middle, and end. If you're going for vague, like very Lenin across the universe, or um, you, you know, Lenin liked to keep things vague because I think, you know, I'm a big fan, and I, I think that he he was never, you know, I think he was quite insecure. So, um, or you just you know, again, it can be pop, it can be just get people to sing along. But again, whatever the song needs, for me, the lyric is, to use the German parlance, it's uber important. Mm -hmm. Everything hangs on the lyric. Right. The melody hangs on the lyric. You know, it's, you know, I know people can put lyric on melody and beat and lyric on melody and and vice versa. But for me, Mm -hmm. I think um, even if it's just the word at the moment, I'm every word I'm writing for these new songs has to be 
you know, standalone almost. Yeah. And you can always hear it when someone's put in uh, words to an existing melody, like there's a certain amount of squeezing and stretching that goes mm. on. I personally am not a massive fan of when people do that. I, I, I really prefer it if you can hear that people have uh, thought of a melody and, and sort of found the words that fit to the melody and not got some words and squeezed it into the melody. Mm. Like, I need the two to really work together more yeah. often than not. It, it should be a marriage or it should be dissonance, you know, it depends. Sure. Yeah, it can absolutely yeah. not work on purpose. You're yeah. right, I enjoy that sometimes too. It can be. Sometimes you don't know why, why it works or doesn't work. But, sure. But I think, yeah, the, the, the lyric is everything in a song and, you know, you do want to be abstract. It's knowing when you should be and knowing yeah, yeah. when you shouldn't be. My first album is quite abstract. Second album is just completely clear. This album is a bit of both. And, yeah. You know, I think I'm learning in the craft as I go. Yeah. I mean, rappers would call it the flow, but it really is that. It's it's because you can create, as you said, tension and dissonance between the melody and the lyrics. Like the sounds of the words, the, the, the vowel sounds and the plosives, where you put them and how they fit together with the melody, or in some cases absolutely don't, mm. like you can really create tension with that. So I guess what I'm really saying is I like when I can hear intention. Like, I don't enjoy it when it just sounds like someone's jammed some stuff in just because they can't be bothered to spend the time. It's craftsmanship. I like Absolutely. I really appreciate yeah. the craftsmanship. Absolutely. And I think the, the more you write, the more edit, editing becomes a factor. Yeah. You know, edit, re-edit. And maybe the song will never be finished. But that's okay, because the mm. song will grow and develop. Mm. So I had a bit of trouble getting in touch with you over the old Facebooks to... Uh, arrange this interview, do you want to maybe elaborate slightly on why I had to wait two or three days sometimes for an answer? Not yeah. that I objected. Sorry about that. It's yeah. fine. Um, it, it wouldn't have happened six months ago, yeah. maybe even a month ago. Yeah. Um, I've just come to a while with social media. I think, um, you know, it's taken so much time. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's, um, I just felt find myself, you know, you sit down in the morning two or three hours when you know, writing to people or, you know, just getting caught up in things and you want to be booking gigs or writing. Most importantly, I think, getting back to the craft. And, yeah, it's just become a serious distraction. Mm -hmm. It's um, So, yeah, that's probably what happened. I, um, I'm, I'm off Messenger now and I'm going, I'm going old school. Can you believe that? Old school is email. <laughs> old school is you call or... SMS How is still that? available via SMS, maybe, right? Maybe, maybe. But imagine, imagine picking up the phone to call people. somebody. Jesus. All right. So that's yeah. only the people who really want to contact you are going to make the effort maybe now. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And I think um, if people want to book or do things like that, obviously, you know, fire an email, you'll find all the details on the website or if it is going to be through Facebook or... But you've got management. They take care of that a bit, right? I do, yeah. Okay. I do, yeah. That must be nice. It is. It is. Uh, I still like to be hands on, though. Yeah. And I think that's what the world we live in. But I think with social media, we become too accessible. Where is the sure. mystery? Where is the mystery? Where's the space? Where's the time? Yeah. You know? I mean, that you're absolutely right. That that takes away. I don't know if there's anything that can be done about this, but it very much takes away the space for the audience to project anything onto you as an artist. David Bowie is a brilliant example of that. He was more or less just about the space, like the project, the projection prints, like yeah, yeah. so much mystery, so much unknown stuff. And you can, as an audience, and as a listener, you can make them who you want or need them to be. And there's a big part of the music experience as well. That is you taking what you need from the experience. Everyone listens inside their own skulls. So uh, skull vibration. Skull. Um, what about you? I mean, what do you think? You, I mean, you're asking all the questions. Maybe, I mean, um, what do you, what do you think? You're you're out there. Yeah, I think that it is difficult to get away from it, and it is disturbing to experience the complete silence. Like if you, if I shut the social media down, which I do sometimes, I have a holiday, like. The likes stop coming, the responses stop coming, and it's a bit disturbing and slightly frightening because you feel like you're not 
there anymore. Like I start to get a mild feeling of panic that I my relevance is steadily dropping the longer I stay away from it. But I need a holiday as well sometimes. Like it freaks me out. Uh, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. The thing is, you're you're blown hot and cold, aren't you? You're coming sure. in and out. And for me, I think I want to develop a balance. Like I was talking to my manager back in Dublin the other day, and he was going, "What's going on? I haven't. There's nothing on. And what's going? You know? And people are asking me here, what's going on? So, yeah. which is kind of cool because people are noticing. People that. give a shit. That's always good. But I find as well that the likes of any have fallen anyway. The way all these new algorithms uh, are working. Facebook's Facebook. got it on lockdown. So, you know. What what do they want and what what do you want and what do you need? I mean, maybe it is down to money. Facebook again. like money. But I mean, you can use you can use the tools and for me, it's it's literally about being a person, you know, because just 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 no time. There's no space. You know, you're on your phone. You see everybody checking their phones. I do it myself. When when's the next gig? You're always available. And you know, just getting back to plants and space. I think that's where exactly where I am. I mean, that's great advice for life, but it's also a brilliant advice for music is uh, give yourself space to be who you are. Like if you're always engaging with other people and if you're always making your identity reliant on who you are to other people, be that friends and family or in a wider sense for musicians or personalities, yeah. you know, your public, uh, you're going to lose touch with who you are and I think maybe you can hear that reflected in the music of musicians sometimes. It's like they just don't have time to get in touch with themselves. Like, and it, I mean, it sounds like a very hippie thing to say, but... Yeah, it, it does, but it's relevant, space. I think, you know, and, and I, uh, maybe that's what I'm searching for. I, I just need to be... Um, I need to be away from it, you know. I need to mm. be exploring my music and exploring myself because I haven't done that. Like, it's... If you if we all if we all look back at the, the amount of time and, and actually added up the amount of time we're on the computers these days, I would get sad. Yeah. I probably shouldn't know that. I'm Facebook. Sure there's an app for that. If Facebook there? are smart, they will never make a function where you can measure the amount of time yeah. in a month that you're on there because that would terrify people. I'm sure. The ultimate question is Facebook on the downslide. Every other social media platform has died. Hasn't it? Well, I can tell you as a teacher, uh, kids between 10 and 18 year olds, uh, they laugh in your face if you ask them if they're on Facebook. Okay. They say, face what? Oh, man, Snapchat. What are kids at your Snap still Boom. Snapchat? Yep. That's even sliding now. Like, right. I don't know what the new hot, hot, hotness is. I was but... on Snapchat for a week with my sister and I just went, oh, man. <laughs> Try Twitter, can't do that. Yeah. Um, Instagram was successful for a while, but yeah. again, it's yeah. it's only repetition. Facebook's going to die when my generation and maybe the gener nah, like okay, ten years below me, okay. fifteen years below me, when they grow up and die, like Facebook's done. So the yeah. the audience is going to shrink, and the the sixteen to twenty five audience on Facebook is. Yeah. Dwindling, dwindling. MySpace was a tragedy, I thought. Oh. I loved it. Yeah, they rebooted it, did you see? Yeah, I haven't. I'd seen it that. It looks really nice. Really? Oh, they made Maybe that's Justin they Timberlake need. helped him out. Yeah, he got on board and made oh. it all vamped up with uh, lovely music websites, like a single website, scrolly type thing, with all things moving at different speeds. Okay, it well, maybe. Noise. Maybe MySpace is the way to go. <sighs> Spacebook. They never come back. Spacebook. They should do a merger. <laughs> I still got a MySpace page. Why do you somewhere? Look around. up, our, look up our ancient MySpace pages. Find anyone. it for me, would you? I'm not going to put the link in the description. You've got to make a bit of an effort if you want to find Send that. Send me the link. You've <laughs> <laughs> you got to find it. Okay, uh, good. Final bit of advice. Uh, advice for serious musicians, uh, or warnings about mistakes that you've made that you would want other people to avoid well either of those options um for, for me i think um if i'm a answering the the question seriously i would say don't take yourself too seriously hmm. you know enjoy it get out there and live it and um, i've always found as well gigging um don't be too quick to analyze yourself or other musicians and don't expect too much learn your craft make the space to to develop as an original musician, if that's the way you're going to go. And um, I, Eddie Izzard once said, um, 
he wouldn't, if he's booking gigs or trying a new show, he said, um, starting out, any musician or performer, give yourself 100 gigs before you start to develop or analyse yourself. Find your own groove naturally. That's a good bit of advice, yeah. Write a hell of a lot of songs as well. Right? Yeah, just do it. And yeah. for me, I'm right in that period of self-development now and mm-hmm. trying new things. And I, I find for myself writing, performing, personality-wise, I'm in a complete different arc, you know, and I don't right. know where it's going. I've no, I've, I've, I've reached and all the goals I've set and now it's just all oblivious I think and like I, I have no direction I don't know what's happening and I, I don't care cool you know I don't care I don't mind um, space again exactly yeah. 100 gigs that's where I am now I'm probably into 15 of those cool and maybe in December same with the band yeah. you know we have a band and we um we take it as it comes obviously we start to reshape now but we're six months into a project so, nice. yeah. space Just space and cucumbers Space and cucumbers, that's your advice, right? No. No? No, I wouldn't say... Uh, I misunderstood you entirely. Maybe, maybe I can't, uh, <laughs> I can't endorse that. that would be taken Don't up endorse cucumbers. Wrong. All right. Look, eat cucumbers, they're very good for you. Do eat them. Do eat them. But not the poisonous ones. I ate a poisonous one the other day. Links to all of your upcoming gigs will be in the description. Um, do make sure you go and check out Shane and his new, it's your new project, right? Yeah. Give us it again, one more time. Shane O'Farrell and the host, but you'll get all the information. On the Links website. will be in the description. So there, yeah. I've got it covered. And uh, thanks very much for coming in. You're very welcome. And thanks I'll, for having me. I'll see you again it. after you've been playing your stadiums. Yeah. You can tell us what's up. Supporting. Thanks, guys. See you on the next episode of Charlie Talk. Jerusalem is burning Look how the star shines full Invincible And When will we ever learn We're still planting seeds in sand With blood-soaked hands Well Turn your TV to the truth Where you fly your paper planes There's no need for parachutes You know the irony is sickening What if the God you love won't answer when you ring We're all three horses high on And with nails and crosses We'll reach the sky Where we're all good children By and by Waiting for all four horses to ride As truth slips sweetly by Maybe we are conscious too Just look at the world we've made As we masticate and chew Once peace was whispered on the breeze Through sounds of hope and truth Forever to hold on to well Turn off your TV, here's the news Look how we step in line Man, how we execute You know the symphony is sickening What if already love was made for queens and kings And we're all three horses 
higher on high and with nails and crosses we'll reach the sky where we all bear witness to higher crimes waiting for all four horses to ride as truth slips sweetly by together do or die and if this is Palestine well then what's yours is mine tell me if this is Palestine From Belfast to Jerusalem, the war of words and hearts is won. Waiting for all three horses, higher on high, and with flames and crosses, we'll burn the sky where we've all laid witness to higher crimes waiting for all four horses to fly waiting for all four horses to ride as truth slips sweetly by